All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Joe Bacella here at Chaken Analytics, and I'd like to welcome you to our presentation of how to remedy post-election jitters and pre-FOMC dread, your five-minute path to better stock choices. Presenting today is Mark Chaken, founder and CEO of Chaken Analytics. Now, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, and we'll send a copy to everyone who has registered. Uh, throughout the session, please submit your questions using the Zoom Q&A window, which you can access in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Now, before we get started, we would like to introduce a friend of ours to who we are all very familiar with. Joining us is the publisher of Malden Economics, Ed D'Agostino. Ed, take it away. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone. I really appreciate you joining us for this presentation. I'm, I'm really happy to, again, be introducing you to Mark Chaikin. Uh, I was introduced to Mark by John Malden uh, over a year ago, and it's really turned into a great relationship and, and partnership for us at Malden Economics. Um, I think I, I said last time on our last webinar that uh, I get pitched on equity evaluation systems all the time, as does John, and we're always very skeptical with good reason. But John took a look under the hood with this one and, and really felt like there was something unique, and he asked me to dig a little deeper. So... I used the system personally for a few months, and I was so impressed that I asked my entire analyst team to vet the system, and now it's been uh, about a year, and we all use Jaken Analytics. Uh, we use it personally, and we use it, uh, it's a critical part of our research process for all of our uh, services at Malden Economics. So I don't want to eat too much into Mark's time because I, I want you all to hear more about his system, more about uh, the data that goes into it, and yet how easy it is to use. So uh, we have a short video to introduce Mark and his power gauge system. So Joe, why don't we roll that video and we'll get Mark in here. Eighty-five percent fundamental, fifteen percent technical. And I created the model because self-directed investors didn't really have the tools and the discipline to successfully manage their own money. And that's created by famous analyst and entrepreneur Mark Chaikin. I'm a big fan of Mark Chaikin, though, so it makes me nervous, Scott, because <laughs> I like his uh, metrics of looking at the market. Mark Chaikin. Mark Chaikin. An expert known on Wall Street for developing computerized stock selection models. Joining us is Mark Chaikin. He is the founder of Chaikin Stock Research. Mr. Chaikin, welcome. Well, thank you, Ed, for that very kind introduction, and welcome, everybody. I'm going to share my screen, uh, and we'll be good to go. This afternoon's webinar is really very, very important because there's a new regime in Washington, and it's um, created a lot of uh, uncertainty. There was uncertainty before the election, and now that the market has done what nobody expected it to do, which was rally on a Trump victory, uh, people are a little bit concerned, and we're coming up into a Fed rate decision in mid-December. So um, Ed and I thought we would put together a webinar to show you how to create a stronger portfolio as we head into 2017. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with me, uh, just a short recap of my career on Wall Street. It spans over 50 years, and I've lived through over 10 bear markets, and part of the reason I've survived 10 bear markets is because 45 years ago, I started using technical analysis in conjunction with fundamental research, and technical analysis is absolutely critical if you're going to survive a bear market, but as you'll see in a slide in just a moment, if you're always looking around the corner for a bear market, or even worse, trying to predict one, as a lot of the talking heads on CNBC are uh, prone to do, you're going to miss out on huge opportunities. And that's part of what I learned by being mentored by some of the smartest and most successful institutional investors. Some of them were colleagues of mine, some of them were clients. Uh, but they weren't looking for bear markets. Uh, sometimes the technical indicators scream at you. And by the way, uh, the technical indicators and, uh, are really the only way that you can know that you're in a bear market, in my opinion. But everything I learned from these successful institutional investors, including people like Peter Lynch and Bill Miller, who were clients of mine, is embodied in the Chaikin Power Gauge rating. This is what got John Malden so excited. This is what Ed D'Agostino is now using and got him excited. It's a 20-factor model, and it reflects what I've learned looking over the shoulders of the smartest institutional investors. It's the culmination of my life's work. I came out of retirement to create this so that 
the same tools that I had created for the large institutional investors would be available to advisors and active traders and investors. We've been fortunate in that Chaikin Analytics has been embraced and adopted, not just by the media, which is easy, uh, or relatively easy, but by some of the smartest and most successful money management firms like Paulson Hedge Fund and Soros and Fidelity, as well as some of the most brilliant uh, top-down macro kind of people like John Malden. So we're very pleased and proud that Barron's wrote us up six months ago as one of the top two quantitative sites on Wall Street. And this is really going to be a very disciplined approach that we're going to expose you to today and teach you some techniques that you can use uh, for years to come because these are proven, tried and true techniques. Now, in today's webinar, we're going to look at five keys to profitable investments in this post-election environment. We're going to show you how to find bullish and bearish candidates using the combination of Chaikin fundamentals and technicals, the Chaikin power gauge rating, and relative strength. We're going to show you how to use Chaikin money flow to predict future price movements. We're going to show you how to dramatically improve your timing with Chaikin and buy and sell signals, and also how to play good defense, because it's going to be very important in this new era of the Trump candidacy. And um, in a conversation that I had a couple of days ago, I called it the Reagan candidacy. I don't know if that's wishful thinking or uh, just a slip of the tongue. But uh, in this new Trump administration, uh, some stocks and industry groups are going to do well. Others are going to suffer. And we're going to show you how to find the best sectors and industry groups to position your portfolio for success in this post-election environment. Now, let me start with a question. Does this big rally that just happened uh, post-election and everything led up to it uh, cause you a little bit of angst? Uh, you know, are you concerned that the uh, Fed rate hike in mid-December may trigger a sell-off like it did a year ago? If so, could you type a big S into the question box? So we can see, you know, what you're feeling and thinking. And what I'm seeing is very similar to what the feedback we're getting from our existing subscribers. Uh, a sense that there's some uncertainty out there, or more than uncertainty, a little bit of fear of the unknown. Uh, and today's webinar is going to address a lot of that. So I'd like to start by talking about where I think the market's headed. And to do that, we use three proprietary Chaikin indicators. Um, I was a market timer and market technician for 35 years, trying to find those bear market tops and bottoms. And I can tell you that uh, you can spend an awful lot of time looking at 20 or 30 different technical indicators. And um, it's not only time consuming, but perhaps counterproductive. So we've narrowed it down to three that really give you everything that you need to know. We look at Shake and Money Flow, which is where many of you know me, that's been in the marketplace for over 35 years. It's available on stockcharts.com, on every online brokerage platform, on Bloomberg and Reuters. It measures institutional buying and selling, and we'll look at it in a very specific way for the S&P 500 ETF, the SPY, which is the most actively traded ETF in the marketplace. Uh, we also have something we call the power bar. This is a little bit of jumping the gun. It shows you the number of stocks in any index, like the SPY industry group, sector, ETF, or list that you might create in Chaikin Analytics that have a bullish versus a bearish power gauge rating, and the bullish stocks have the potential to outperform, as you'll see in a minute. The bearish stocks are likely to underperform. And then finally, a very unique approach to breadth analysis. We're going to look at how the average stock in the S&P is doing relative to the S&P itself, which, as most of you know, is a capitalization-weighted index that can be overly influenced by the so-called FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, plus Apple and Microsoft thrown in. So let's start out with a one-year chart of the SPY. And as a frame of reference, we're going to start with this W bottom that we had in January, February. Now, that should look like the letter W to you, and um, we'll see in a minute why that's so important. But the key takeaway as we start this analysis is that the Chaikin money flow was actually 
green or positive. It looks back over 21 days of trading, and it normally fluctuates around the zero line, uh, red being below the line and green meaning this accumulation. But as we were forming that important bottom, culminating on February 11th when Jamie Dimon announced that he was buying $26.5 million worth of J.P. Morgan stock, which, by the way, he's now got a 50% profit on. He's got a, almost a $20,000 profit on that purchase. So that wasn't just a couple of thousand shares of window dressing by a corporate CEO. That was a serious commitment. And check and money flow was extremely positive going forward as we traded up to resistance up here at 2130, finally broke through in July. And shake and money flow showed that the institutions kept buying the dips and supporting the rally until we peaked in August. And then money flow started dropping off. And then finally, in late September, as the market was still above res uh, support, which was the former resistance area 2130, money started coming out of the market ahead of the election. And leading up to the election, we had a nine-day decline. It's the first nine-day decline since 1980. But that decline was only 3% in magnitude. So on Monday preceding the election, the market surprised everybody and started to rally. But it rallied with check and money flow negative and with the, the power bar negative. Now, it wasn't until yesterday's rally that the power bar actually turned positive. This is really critical, but it's still not strong enough, in my view, to support a wildly bullish case. 120 stocks in the S&P have positive power gauge ratings. 112 have negative. It's sort of evenly divided. And you've gotten overbought and still haven't broken through that important resistance at 2180 to 2200. So we're in a wait and see mode relative to the large cap stocks. And something happened in terms of this relative strength indicator. We had the average stock in the S&P outperforming the largest stocks starting in late February. But then again, in early October, that reversed. The FANG stocks started outperforming yet again. And it wasn't until this post-election rally that the average stock in the S&P started to regain. And it's important to note that that's a confidence indicator. It's a way to measure investor confidence. So the large cap sector is a little bit questionable here to me, but the small cap sector is clear cut. This is the IWM, the Russell 2000 small cap index. And that made a new all time high in here over the last four days. So whereas the S&P has been banging up against resistance and the NASDAQ had been lagging until yesterday and today, 726 stocks in the Russell 2000 have a bullish power gauge rating versus only 211 with bearish ratings, almost a three and a half to one ratio. That is a big sign of confidence. When investors are willing to buy small cap stocks, they're expressing confidence in the overall economy. Part of the reason is that if Donald Trump follows through with his infrastructure uh, build promises, that's going to help a lot of small cap stocks in the building materials industry, in the transportation industry. So there's a reason why people have been barreling into small cap stocks. In fact, small cap stocks rallied 14% the week of the election into yesterday's peak. So this is all very important, but I want to contrast it to what's going on in the bond market. Now, if you're watching CNBC, you may have heard a lot of people express surprise at how weak the bond market's been post-election. Well, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody. This is a chart of the TLT, the 20-year Treasury ETF, and it peaked in June and started down and we got what we call relative strength sell signals because we compare it to the action of the stock market or the S&P 500. And you can see the relative underperformance from June on and check and money flow, which measures institutional buying and selling was decidedly negative long ahead of the election. So here in 
early to mid-October to late October, look where the bond market was. It was making new four-month lows. Now, remember, we've had a 30-year bull market in bonds. And I know a lot of you are longer-term investors or advisors. You're either helping people grow their retirement nest eggs or you're trying to do it yourself. And you can't fund your retirement with zero interest rate treasury bonds. And this is after a 30-year bull market. So I saw a lot of people on CNBC saying, oh, the bull market and bonds isn't over. Well, you go buy a dip like that and try and make money, and you're a better man than I am. I'm a technician when it comes to bonds because I'll leave the macroeconomic stuff to the true knowledgeable people like John Malden, but I can look at a chart and tell you that bond prices are going down and yields are going up. And I don't know if they're going to 3 or 4% like some people are predicting, but they're certainly not going back down to that 130, 150 level on the 10-year treasury. So summing this all up, we've got an environment where small caps are strong, fixed income is weak, and large cap stocks are sort of divided. And there's a good reason they're divided, because a lot of large cap stocks had big dividend yields. And when interest rates broke through 2% on the 10-year treasury on the way up to 230, which is one of the biggest moves in history in such a short span of time from 170 to 230 on a 10-year treasury, a lot of these stocks with big dividend yields, and we're going to see in what sectors they're in in a few minutes, have been under pressure because people are taking their profits or they may have bought in too high. So bottom line is we're cautiously bullish on the market. It has to prove itself in terms of large caps by breaking through 2,200. Seasonally, we're favorably inclined to that, so this may all play out after Thanksgiving. But we've all experienced the volatility of the market. That's why there's some angst out there. We had it in August, September of 15. We had it in December, January, February of 16. We had that Brexit sell-off. It's important to note that volatility is not a recent phenomenon. Every year, stocks experience significant corrections. In fact, over the last 30 years, the average annual correction has been 14%. Now, that encompasses some bear market years, but uh, typically, you'll see a correction of anywhere from 8 to 10% almost every year, even though the market t tends to finish higher. So those who stay the course have been rewarded. But what this webinar is going to focus on is that staying the course does not mean buy and hold or putting your feet in cement. It means being alert to where the money is going and which sectors and industry groups have the best potential and which ones to avoid because you don't have to stay the course by being stubborn. You can stay the course by being nimble. So let's put pullbacks into perspective and then move on to the proprietary chicken work. Since 1945, 71 years, there have been 70 de 75 declines of between 5 and 10 percent. So this is a common occurrence. It happens roughly once a year. And that decline typically lasts a month. But more importantly, it only takes a month to recover back to new highs. So these corrections are your friend, but if you're watching CNBC, or reading the headlines in the newspapers, this is when all the bears come out every year. It doesn't matter what kind of market you're in. You get a decline of 6 or 8%, and there are going to be people out there telling you it's the start of a bear market. Don't believe them. Now, you've had 27 declines of 10 to 20%, roughly one every three years. Those are more challenging. And that's when you end up getting a W bottom like we saw in January, February. Declines of less than 10% typically end in what's known as a V-shaped bottom. You make that low, and then a month later, you're back up to a new high. That's where the phrase buy the dips has come from. The 10 to 20% declines are more challenging, and that's why we look at things like shake and money flow and our breadth indicators to guide us as to when those declines are likely to be over. Now, there have only been 11 bear markets, which is defined as the S&P 500 dropping more than 20% since 1945 in 71 years. 
if you're out there constantly looking for a bear market, seeing shadows around the, the next interest rate hike, you're going to miss out on huge opportunities. So this webinar is now all about how you find the right opportunities and also what to avoid so that you're not in harm's way. So one final slide in terms of what the likely scenario for 2017 is. This chart is courtesy of Bank America, Merrill Lynch, and I love it because it really points to where I think the market is going to be influenced in 2017, namely higher interest rates and rising earnings. Now we've got a Fed meeting in mid-December where there's a 90% probability that we'll get a rate hike. That's actually bullish for stocks. It's bullish for financials. It's a reflection of a strengthening economy. And we will have rising earnings in the fourth quarter. In the third quarter, which reporting-wise ends tomorrow when Walmart reports after the close, we broke a six-quarter earnings recession. For six straight quarters th through the end of the second quarter of 16, yet year-over-year decline in earnings, primarily because of energy weakness and a strong dollar, which was a headwind for stocks that trade overseas, multinational U.S. companies. Uh, the dollar is strong once again, but in the third quarter, we had, for the first time, rising earnings. We've got the job market strong. We've got wage increases. There's going to be a little bit of inflation, which is another reason I think we're going to see higher rates. But this is all very bullish. It's that upper right quadrant. This is the most bullish scenario for stocks, and it's where I think we're going to be in 2017. So let's start the webinar with an old maxim from Warren Buffett that you should be fearful when others are greedy and greedy only when others are fearful because a lot of what this webinar is all about is convincing you that there is a discipline methodology that you can employ to take advantage of volatility to buy into those 5 to 10% dips or the 10 to 20% ones at the right time and I'll start out with an example of that. F5 Networks, symbol FF5E, was in a downtrend. It was underperforming the market. How do we know that? This is our relative strength indicator. We've taken those numbers that you can get from Investors Business Daily or a number of other services that rank stocks from 1 to 99, converted them into a red-green heat map, made it very easy for you to see visually whether a stock is outperforming or underperforming. You can also use our screener to find those. But if you want to go to Investors Business Daily and deal with all those numbers, have at it. They're accurate, they're good, but they're very difficult to carry around with you. So FFIV was underperforming. And then in mid-April, and this is an advanced look at what our power gauge looks like on a chart. This is a one-year chart goes from red to yellow to green. In mid-April, the power gauge rating, which summarizes those 20 factors that we'll show you in a minute, turned bullish. And a week later, FFIV started outperforming the market back here in the 100 to 105 area. And look at the accumulation. Check in money flow measures institutional buying and selling. Someone was aware that there was a turnaround in this stock or something a little more insider-ish. So the stock started moving up, and then one day back in June, it spiked from 105 all the way to 125. Now, why did it do that? Because there were takeover rumors in the stock. Now, we don't like buying spikes because you're playing with emotions instead of a cool head. So I normally say to people, if a stock spikes up and everything is looking good, wait for it to pull back, which can be a sideways to down move over three to eight days, and then buy the stock. Well, in this case, that's exactly what was happening, and it was starting move, to move back up to new highs when Brexit hit in late June. And you got a two-day sell-off from 123 all the way back down to 107. And one of our six pairs of buy and sell signals was triggered. We call this an oversold buy signal. A stock with a bullish power gauge rating, meaning the bullish fundamentals, makes a new eight-day low 
and it gets oversold. It's a really simple pattern. Things don't have to be complex to be powerful. And that was an example of taking advantage of fear in the marketplace. A buy signal right at the bottom of that sharp correction, knowing that the power gauge rating, the money flow, and relative performance to the market was strong. And sure enough, the stock rallied up, had a positive earnings surprise. We've got an earnings module in Chaken Analytics, really important to monitor earnings on a quarterly basis. And it made a new high above 125. And then profit taking came in, sell off in September, another oversold buy signal after a three week decline, rally again, and finally a second positive earnings surprise. And now the stock is off to the races. So here's an example of taking advantage of fear. But the key is having the confidence in whatever methodology you're using to be able to pull the trigger because no matter how good your analytics are, if you don't have the confidence to pull the trigger and be greedy when other people are fearful, all is for naught. Now, I talked about what William O'Neill does with relative strength, putting it on a scale from one to 99. It's a wonderful way to do it. We actually do it under the surface. But the problem is that contributes to our biggest impediment to success in life and in the markets, which is information overload. Numbers are hard to carry around in your head. Pictures are easy to absorb. So the key to making money in the market is to focus in the age of distraction. Have a disciplined methodology, follow it, know why you're using that methodology and when it works and when it doesn't work, and filter out the noise. The talking heads on CNBC, except of course, John Malden. And the headlines that'll just scare you out of your positions, caused you sleepless nights, you gotta stay focused. So our Solution to the information overload problem is Chaken Analytics for iPad and desktop. And the centerpiece of Chaken Analytics is our power gauge rating. And that's how Chaken Analytics leads to consistent profits in the stock market, whether you're an investor or a trader, whether you use stocks or options, you need a directional edge. I ran an options department for a really fine regional brokerage firm called Tucker Anthony and RL Day in the late 70s and early 80s. We had over 300 stockbrokers scattered throughout New England, thousands of clients trading options, and I can tell you that 95% of them lost money in spite of my best efforts to educate them because they didn't understand the importance of a directional edge. And it's as true in the stock market as it is in the options market. The way we give you a directional edge is by combining fundamentals with technicals into a quantitative model on 5,000 US equities that does the heavy lifting for you. And then we layer in shake and buy and sell signals to help you improve your entries and exits. If you'll agree that we've been in volatile market climate, volatile markets demand a disciplined methodology for all the reasons that we just mentioned. And this pyramid encapsulates the Chaikin methodology. At the top of the pyramid, the Chaikin power gauge rating, it's a ribbon on the chart, it's a gauge that goes from very bearish to very bullish, but please recognize that industry group and sector strength and weakness is also very important. It's one of the factors in the power gauge, but it's also a way to find stocks the way the institutions find them. At the bottom of this pyramid, two technical indicators. Shaken money flow, which is available everywhere, and shaken relative strength, which is only available in shaken analytics. When you combine them with the power gauge rating, you're getting the best of the fundamental analysis and technical analysis. And the sweet spot there is in the middle are buy and sell signals. Now, the power gauge rating looks very simple, but please don't confuse simple with simplistic because, as I like to say, the power gauge rating is like a Chevrolet with a Ferrari engine under the hood. It's very powerful. During earnings season, it can be your GPS. I know a lot of people get very anxious during earnings season. There's a lot of volatility. There's a lot of 
angst over whether stocks are going to disappoint or outperform. And you need some sort of guidelines, just like you need a GPS to get around the traffic on a busy Thanksgiving travel day. And the shake and power gauge rating can do that. And the reason it can do that, and it's done it for five and a half years since it became commercially available in January of 2011, is because we've got 20 factors reduced down in a one-year research project from 200 that reflect the way Wall Street works. These are the factors that institutional investors look at every day. Now, they don't all look at each of these components because we've divided these 20 factors into four components so they would make sense to you. Financial metrics are 35% of the model, and that's what a Warren Buffett looks at. Value investors look at free cash flow, debt to equity, price to sales ratio. It's sort of the bedrock of the model. These factors don't change very much. Earnings are what a Jim Cramer focuses on or any sort of earnings-oriented institutional investor. And I, and I boxed earnings surprise here in red because when I was at Drexel Burnham, one of my mentors was a gentleman named George Douglas who built one of the top quantitative databases on Wall Street. And George also did the original research on earnings surprise and earnings estimate revisions. And what he taught me is embodied in the model. First, he told me that earnings surprises come in bunches. If a company is going downhill and reports a negative earnings surprise, it typically doesn't end with one quarter of bad earnings. Conversely, when a company starts to outperform, there's usually a good reason for it, and it tends to persist. And very often, you'll see companies with positive earnings surprises for four, six, eight, or 12 quarters in a row. That's what happened to Southwest Air in 2013 and 14. Positive earnings surprises because the price of energy was going down. It continued into 2015. And the second thing that George taught me was that when companies report earnings surprises, analysts change their estimates. And when analysts change their estimates, that's the biggest short-term mover of stock prices. So in this model, which I call an eclectic model, you combine longer term value factors like financial metrics, along with earnings factors and expert opinions, insider activity, analyst ratings, short interest and the like. The model is only 15% technical. It keeps the model honest, but this is a fundamental model that can do the heavy lifting for you. And here are the performance results. This chart combines life-to-date performance from 1999 through 2016 using the Russell 3000, a big, broad universe, as our base. Over that 16-year period, the average very bullish stock, 428 of them at any given point in time in Chaikin Analytics, was up almost 20% a year. The average very bearish stock, even after a seven-and-a-half-year bull market, down 1%. And in 2015, it really got interesting because small cap stocks were in a bear market. This is the Russell 3000, and the average very bearish stock was down over 17%. These were your fracking stocks, rails, cloud computing stocks, small caps in general. The average very bearish stock down 17% in a year when the S&P 500 was up almost 1%. The average very bearish stock down 1%. It's the ability to know the difference between a stock that's likely to outperform the market or underperform that's at the heart of the success we've had with the Chaikin Power Gauge rating. And two final proof points. And the reason I'm spending so much time on this is I want you to come away from this webinar believing that a discipline methodology can work, that this isn't like a finding gold in the stream behind your house in Connecticut, that there are discipline methodologies out there that can help you make better informed and more profitable investment decisions. So we've got two partnerships at Chaikin Analytics, one with NASDAQ and one with First Trust Portfolios. First Trust Portfolios is the largest creator of unit investment trusts, $57 billion worth last year. They can only be bought through advisors or brokers. And in December of 
2015, they launched the first Chaikin low beta growth large cap unit investment trust. There have been four series in total. A fifth one is going to be launched next week, roughly every three months. And all four of the existing series are outperforming their benchmarks. And they've raised over $50 million. So what we're teaching you is now the basis for over $50 million of investable products. Now with NASDAQ, <clears throat> excuse me, we launched three co-branded NASDAQ Chaikin indexes in April of 2014. And by the way, those first trust portfolios are buy and hold portfolios. So even though some of the examples we're going to show you in a minute reflect short to intermediate term entry points, the power gauge also works if you're trying to grow your retirement nest egg. So with NASDAQ, we created these indexes that are rebalanced every 12 months. We took the large cap, small cap, and dividend achiever indexes, applied the Chaikin methodology using the power gauge rating as the final filter, and came up with a subset, typically 20 to 25% of the index, that represented the cream of the crop. And all three of these indexes, after three rebalances, are significantly outperforming their benchmarks. Large cap by 500 basis points, small cap by 1,600 basis points over 32 months, and dividend achievers. And I'll focus on that, and then we'll move on, because the NASDAQ Dividend Achiever Index has been around since 1979. Vanguard licensed it in 2006, created an ETF with the symbol VIG that has $25 billion in it. $25 billion. That index has been up 10.6% over the last 32 months. The NASDAQ Chaikin Index, which represents about 65 out of the 235 stocks, has been up 27%, almost 200% better, or 1,650 basis points. This is the message I'd like to convey to you. A disciplined methodology based on the way Wall Street actually works, which is what the power gauge rating is, can help you make better decisions and more profitable decisions. So let's start with some bottom-up stock picking techniques that we've honed over the last four years. We have a pattern we call classic shake and bulls. Power gauge rating is bullish, meaning that the fundamental are favorable for the stock. It's outperforming the market. So that's validation. And shake and money flow is green, not red, telling you that the institutions are buying the stock, not selling it. So here's an example of a classic shake and bill. It's called WellCare Health. WCG is the symbol. We've got a one-year chart. The power gauge rating turned bullish in late January. And about two weeks later, the relative strength indicator turned bullish with positive money flow. The stock was trading about 85. And in a steady upward climb with buy signals along the way and positive earnings surprises, the stock has gone from about 85 to 130. And each time it made a new high at this upper volatility band, money flow was positive. So it was sort of a, all systems go until you got a spike up after the late October earnings report and the stock spiked up to new highs, shaken money flow was negative. What did that tell us? Well, that's what we call a money flow sell alert. It says the institutions who were buying the stock all the way up we're starting to take profits. And you've got three new highs in the stock with money flow staying negative. It's time to take money off the table. Even if you're a long-term investor, it's time to say thank you and book your profits. <clears throat> now, a classic take and bear is the exact opposite. Power gauge rating is bearish. Stock is underperforming the market. Shake and money flow is red, not green, telling you the institutions are selling it. And our poster child is Chipotle. Now, the power gauge rating actually turned bearish at 690 off the charts sometime in the uh, late summer to early fall of 15. Then you got a negative earnings surprise, and then the E. coli crisis surfaced. Power gauge rating was already bearish. Stock was 
underperforming the market, and you could have avoided the pain of watching the stock go from 650 to 690 all the way down to 365 where it bottomed out two weeks ago if you followed this discipline. Now, when the power gauge rating and relative strength are both in the same direction, we say that the market is agreeing with the model. Really important to understand that concept, and we're going to get into it in a big way in a moment. No matter how good your fundamental research is, whether it's a quantitative model, whether it's traditional fundamental research, whether it's garnered from watching Mad Money or listening to the Malden Economics team, if the market doesn't agree with you, at best, it's dead money. And at worst, you get into a situation like a Chipotle. Now, in Shake and Analytics, we make it easy for you to find these stocks. We have hot lists. In this case, we're looking at our power gauge hot list. Show you all the stocks that are bullish or very bullish or that turn bullish this week and so forth. So we make it easy to zero in on the stocks, but we also have a screener that enables you to do it in seconds. Now, I talked about the power gauge rating and shaken relative strength as being critical to this disciplined investment process, which has helped us find winning stocks in these NASDAQ indexes and for the first trust portfolios. We call it the dynamic duo because it helps find big winners and losers. The power gauge rating and relative strength basically enable you to combine technicals and fundamentals in a methodical way. And it's at the heart of our methodology. Just be aware that relative strength stands alone as a bullish or a bearish indicator. And what I mean by that is we have these stocks that we've categorized as momentum stocks. They've existed in the 50 years that I've been in Wall Street. In fact, the original technical research that I did was on relative strength. It worked back in the 60s and it works today because it measures supply and demand in the stock market. But just be aware that if you're in a stock like a Tesla or a cloud computing stock or a GoPro, and it's not supported by the fundamentals, you're on a high wire without a safety net. And when something changes, as it inevitably does, and that stock falls off the high wire, it's very painful both emotionally and financially. So that combination of relative strength and money flow and power gauge rating can help you avoid these stocks or at least know when it's time to exit the momentum party. The second concept that related is called spotting personality changes. It's really the key to making and keeping profits in the stock market. We define a personality change as a stock that's been outperforming the market where our relative strength indicator is green that starts underperforming, meaning that the relative strength indicator has turned negative or red. The reverse is true on the upside. The biggest mistake investors make is falling in love with stocks. I call it putting your feet in cement. You fall in love with a stock like Tesla or GoPro and fail to see that the market psychology around that stock has changed. My old friend Marty Zweig put it really simply, listen to the market. Let the market tell you what's happening. Don't believe that you can tell the market what to do. So let's look at a couple of examples of personality changes. Here's Qualcomm. Stock was in a downtrend, totally mismanaged tech company till about a year ago. They have chips in every iPhone and, I, and tablet, as you know, every smartphone. Uh, but the company didn't even know how much it was spending on R&D or what it, ROI was. And we know that because they admitted that at a Merrill Lynch technology conference. No wonder the stock was making new lows. But something changed in February. The power gauge rating was bearish. The stock was underperforming the market. But smart money sensed a turnaround. And you broke a downtrend and then went sideways. And then finally, you got what we call a bullish personality change. It was important to recognize that because if you were on the sidelines in Qualcomm and knew that there had been a positive earnings surprise and a bullish personality change with very strong check and money flow, you could have started moving into a bullish position in the stock. And then the power gauge turned bullish. 
briefly in mid-May and then again in July. And the stock was in this 53 to 55 range. And then finally, it broke out with another positive earnings surprise. Remember I said that earnings surprises come in bunches. And the stock kept making new highs, peaking at 70, pulling back, and then going back up to 70 again. But look at what Chaken Money Flow was doing as it made this final high up here at 71. We got another bearish money flow sell alert. So if you were fortunate enough to be following this concept of the dynamic duo and got into the stock between 50 and 55, here's your exit point. If you followed any of these relative strength buy signals, time to take your profits. And by the way, all six pairs of our buy and sell signals are on our website, chickenanalytics.com. Whether you're a visitor or a subscriber, we lay out the rationale for these signals. Now, here's an example of a bearish personality change. It's a stock we all know, Starbucks. And back here in late February with the power gauge bearish, the stock started underperforming the market. It was in the 57, 58 area. And along the way, there have been a number of sell signals and the stock has never been able to go above our long-term trend line. And just recently made a new 52 week low. If you are enamored with Starbucks and their new products, Tivana and the new drinks, the market was saying, don't buy into that. Whether it's because of saturation or cutbacks on the part of the consumer, the market was agreeing with a bearish power gauge rating, and the stock has basically been a bad place to be parking your money over the last year. Because occasionally, not with a Starbucks necessarily, you're going to be in a stock like Sun Edison, which is in the solar energy field where you had a bearish money flow sell alert back up above 30 in July of 15. And then you'll find that the institutions are selling it. The power gauge turns bearish, relative strength turns weak. So you've got the dynamic duo working against you on the downside and market agreeing with the model. And here's a stock where Brokerage firms like Merrill Lynch and some of the very big hedge funds like Einhorn had huge positions in Sun Edison with all this debt, which is why the power gauge was bearish, doing off balance sheet shenanigans like Enron did, ultimately filing for bankruptcy in April of 2016. Now, Merrill Lynch put out a sell recommendation on the stock at $3 down from 28. You don't want to have to be dependent on Wall Street. You want to be independent of Wall Street. Have your own metrics, your own benchmarks, your own guideposts to know whether you should be in a stock or avoiding it. And when we exhibited at a conference in California back in May, I was demoing our system and someone was looking over my shoulder. And after I showed Sun Edison to someone as an example of how Chaikin can help keep you out of trouble if you follow the power gauge rating and our relative strength indicator. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I'm Ed, I'm from Philadelphia as well, work for Merrill Lynch. And I bought Sun Edison on the way down at 15 from 30 because my firm was still recommending it. And what he told me was if I'd been using Chaikin, I would have saved myself and my clients a lot of pain and money. So here's another stock that's getting involved in the solar energy business. Elon Musk, who's just been on CNBC in the last half hour promoting some new scheme, is someone I call the P.T. Barnum of the 21st century. He'll say or do anything to prop up the stocks that he controls. Tesla is one of them. We've had a bearish rating on Tesla for over a year, and it's gone nowhere in spite of all the hype. And now he is convinced the shareholders to let Tesla buy Solar City, another company that he controls with enormous debt, negative cash flow. It could sink the whole ship, especially with the new regime in Washington, which is not as concerned about climate change or global warming, not as concerned about renewable energy. So solar and electric cars doesn't mean as much to Donald Trump as it did to Barack Obama. 
That's your example of being on a high wire without a safety net. The psychology has changed around Tesla. And there's enormous competition from BMW, General Motors, Mercedes, the Japanese car companies. There's no guarantee that Elon Musk, for all his bra bravado, is going to be successful. But you don't have to know that. Just follow the power gauge. If you like Tesla, drive the car, but sell the stock. The power gauge and the market and money flow are telling you that's what you should be doing. Now, one final concept, and you've seen a hint of it. We call it monitoring stealth buying and selling. And the reason it's important is that institutional investors have gotten so large, they can't execute all their trades on the same day. It takes days and weeks, but they're paranoid about other people knowing what they're doing. So they try and mask their buying and selling. And there's a pattern we call stealth accumulation. And here it is. This is a company called Gibraltar Industries. It's a small cap stock, ROCK. Power gauge has been bullish for over a year. Stock's been outperforming the market. And in this period between May and October, we had stealth accumulation. And what we mean by that is even when the stock dropped 10% or went sideways for three weeks, money flow stayed green or positive, meaning that knowledgeable investors, Smart investors, institutional investors, insiders were accumulating the stock on weakness. They weren't contributing to the selling. And here's a stock that's going to benefit from any infrastructure spending. They're in the building products area. But yet again, after a long run and a string of positive earnings surprises, the stock has made a new high and taken money flow is negative. What does that tell me? It tells me to take some money off the table. Smart Money is now taking their profits. The stock's had a huge run, and it may continue to work higher after a correction, but this is a pattern that's worked for over 30 years. We've taught this to institutional investors since 1983. And now you've learned the secrets of the Wall Street insiders. Now, here's another example. We looked at the IWM, we saw small cap stocks were strong. Here's a second example, Central Garden and Pet. It's a small Florida-based company, garden supplies, and now in the very, very hot pet supply area. You see down at the bottom from our scrolling news alerts that Central Garden acquired the largest wholesale of aquarium fish about three weeks ago. Power gauge has been bullish, but look at the accumulation. That's what we call stealth accumulation. Even when you went sideways here, money flow stayed positive. When you had a correction back in August, September, that lasted almost a month, were there sellers in there? No, no. The buyers just sat on their hands, let the market sort itself out, and lo and behold, the stock's making a new high. Another example of a small cap stock with stealth accumulation. These are powerful patterns, and they're very easy to spot. Just look for stocks making corrections where money flow stays positive. Now, here's an example of stealth distribution. This is McDonald's, which had a big run-up. Remember, we said relative strength stands on its own. Here's an example. McDonald's went from 89 to 130 because people felt that the company's new management had turned it around. And money flow was following relative strength, but the fundamentals just didn't support it. So the power gauge was neutral. Then you made a new high above 130. Look where money flow was. It was negative. That's another bearish money flow sell alert. So you could have been taking your profits in McDonald's at 130. And with the power gauge neutral, that's something I would have suggested. And then the stock started coming down. And in early May, at about 124, the power gauge turned bearish. And the stock made a new 52-week low just ahead of the elections. Along the way, stealth distribution. Even when you got a big spike up here, money flow stayed negative. The institutions, even with this rally up to resistance, are just not buying into this. There's some short covering going on. There's a little bit of group rotation, but the bottom line is if you can avoid stocks like this or sell them on strength, buy put options if you trade in the options market, you're gonna position yourself with profitable trades. 
Now we have six pairs of buy and sell alerts in Jacob, fully disclosed on our website. And it's really important to understand that to trade more profitably, you need to follow a discipline methodology. Follow the signals. Because any discipline that's based on proven analytics gives you conviction to pull the trigger. And that's a heck of a lot better than trading on your emotions. So the example we have up here is Morgan Stanley, which is a stock that we recommended in our weekly market letter that comes bundled with Chaken Analytics called Market Insights. And on the way down, when the rating was bearish, we got these money flow sell signals, 34, and then again at 32 on the way down to 22. And then as the stock turned around and the power gauge rating turned bullish in April, we started getting a series of buy signals. This is an example of following the signals. It takes the emotion out of the equation, positions you in stocks ahead of positive earnings surprises, and then sometimes you get lucky and you get an unexpected reaction to an exogenous event like a presidential election and Morgan Stanley is off and running making new highs. Now, we've created dashboards in Chaken Analytics for any list, ETF, index, or industry group in the system, whether you create the list or we create it. On any given day, you can look in this case, I'm looking at a list of 180 stocks that we call my stocks that we encourage everybody to create. And on a webinar that I gave on November 2nd, prior to the election, just two weeks ago, in my 170 stocks, there were a series of buy and sell signals. Pega, which is a software company, gave an oversold buy at a price of 30.20. And I knew that stock well because our first chief technology officer came from Pega. And then TripAdvisor, which I had been following as a bearer stock for over a year, gave a reversal sell signal at 61.63. So let's see how those worked out. Well, there's your buy signal in Pega. Again, tough to pull the trigger when people are being fearful, but the methodology encourages you to do that. And the stock went from 30 all the way to 34.80, or 35 actually, on the Trump rally. The signals get you in. TripAdvisor, on the other hand, gave that sell signal above 60, 62 and changed, had another negative earnings surprise. Remember, they come in bunches. And the stock dropped all the way down to 49. But look at that sea of red here, power gauge, relative strength, Shaken money flow telling you it was a stock to avoid, and you could have dodged the pain of watching the stock make a deep new 52 week low or bought put options to benefit on the downside. Now, we said that we would show you how to make money in 2017, and I think the key to making money in 2017 is to monitor group and sector trends. And this chart shows you why. With the S&P within 1% of its all-time high, 10% of the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange made new 52-week lows yesterday. Now, 10% also made new highs. In the original technical research that I did, this would be a big, big red flag. And typically this happens when interest rates are going up because many of the instruments that trade on the New York Stock Exchange are related to changes in interest rates. They're either high yield stocks or they're bond ETFs or what have you. So this is a sort of red flag that says you can't just indiscriminately buy stocks and expect to make money in 2017. So the best way I know to position yourself for success is what I call the top-down path to profits post-election. Focus on sectors and industry groups. And we enable you to do that in a very, very powerful way. We take the nine select spider sector ETFs, and now there are 10 of them because they broke real estate out of the financials and gave it its own symbol, XLRE, and we rank them by potential, meaning 
how many have bullish versus bearish power gauge ratings? Because that does indicate the stock's potential, as we pointed out over the next three to 12 months, to outperform or underperform the market. Right at the top of the list, financials, 42 stocks with bullish ratings. These are the large cap names in the S&P, zero with bearish ratings. Then technology and healthcare. And at the bottom, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, and utilities with real estate bunched in there. Now, why are these stocks down at the bottom based on potential? Well, A, they got very, very overvalued when people were hungry for yield and were willing to buy at any price stocks with high yields like Coca-Cola and some of the conservative drug stocks like Pfizer and Merck. But things are changing. Now, if you want to get a more granular look, I recommend that you look at the industry groups. In this case, we're looking at the 20 spider subsector ETFs. And right at the top are four financial groups, regional banks, major banks, insurance companies, capital market stocks like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Right under that, aerospace, defense, semiconductor, and transportation, subsets of technology and industrials that are likely to benefit from a Trump presidency. He said he's going to rebuild the military. It takes the aerospace and defense stocks to new highs. Transportation stocks are strong. If you're going to move more coal around the country, because coal is now going to become a preferred source of energy, move more steel around to build infrastructure projects. This is how you find the sectors and the groups that likely have the most potential. So let's zero in initially on the negative sectors because they illustrate the importance of playing good defense. Too many webinars that I've attended and that I've delivered focus on the home run, finding the next big winner, when what you really should be doing is focusing on eliminating the losers because playing good defense is all about the stocks that you don't own. Herb Greenberg, who used to write for CNBC and thestreet.com, wrote a piece in January of 2014, and I've used this in my webinars ever since, almost two years later, two and a half years later. It's the stocks you don't own that matter. And what I'm gonna zero in on here is that by avoiding weak sectors and industry groups, you're playing good defense and you're eliminating the stocks from your portfolio and your radar screen that are most likely to cause you the biggest problems. So let's look at those sectors that were at the bottom of the potential in the large cap S&P 500. XLY is consumer discretionary. It had a bearish personality change in May and it's been underperforming the market ever since and shaken money flow has turned weak here as we've rallied up. Now, look at the stocks in consumer discretionary. It's a diverse group of stocks, everything from Amazon to Nike to TJ Maxx. We've already seen Chipotle as a bearish stock, Starbucks and TripAdvisors. So you see there's a pattern there. The stocks that I pick in my market letter that I use as illustrations in these teaching webinars, I come by through a disciplined methodology. I start with that top-down methodology. What we started looking at was a bottom-up stock picking methodology. Now we're doing what the institutions tend to do. They look at the market from a top-down macro view, starting with sectors and industry groups. So let's look at two of those bearish stocks. Nike, great name. I think you'd all be surprised to know that it was making a new 52-week low just as of a week ago. And there's a good reason for that. A, Under Armour is nipping at their heels, signing professional athletes to big contracts, but an old name has come back from the dead to haunt Nike. Now, does anybody know what company is starting to eat into Nike's profits? If you do, type that into the question box. And I see that a couple of people are following the stock very closely because Adidas has started to make an impact. It's taking market share away from Nike, but you don't have to know any of that. The analysts that follow Nike know that. 
and the power gauge has been bearish off and on since late February. You got a bearish personality change in late February and the stock has been toxic ever since. You could have been buying Foot Locker with a bullish power gauge rating and making money while Nike was making a new 52 week low. And you get setups along the way to get you out of the stock and into put options. Now Under Armour, which has also been trying to eat into Nike's market share has got a bearish power gauge as well and has been underperforming the market with weak shake and money flow. There's your stealth distribution. Stock went sideways for five weeks and money flow stayed negative, never once went positive. And you had some wonderful put setups ahead of a disappointing earnings report just three weeks ago when the stock made a new 52-week low, gapping down from 38 all the way down to $30. But there is one stock in the apparel group, in that consumer discretionary group, that actually still has a bullish power gauge rating. And it highlights why our earnings surprise factor is so important and our earnings alerts. PVH, which makes Calvin Klein jeans and maiden form bras and a whole host of mundane things like Philip Van and shirts, which is where the PVH symbol came in, was due to report earnings back in March of 2016. And the street.com wrote that PVH closed down ahead of tomorrow's earnings report. About an hour later, Jim Cramer said, exercise caution with PVH ahead of earnings. Now, if you were following the Chaikin methodology, you would have seen a bullish earnings alert. And as you'll see on the next chart, you would have seen very, very positive Chaikin money flow ahead of that earnings report. And here's what happened. They reported a positive earnings surprise and the stock was up 7% pre-market. Don't depend on brokerage firms or gurus. Become independent. Filter your research through Chaikin if you do it yourself. Use us as your primary source. A lot of people do it either way. Here's what happened with PVH. The yellow arrow is where those articles were written. Money flow was very, very strong. Institutions were expecting something big and they were accumulating the stock. Power gauge was bullish and you got a positive earnings surprise and it spiked up to new highs. And you've had a series of three more positive earnings surprises. The next earnings report is due out, as we see on the top of the chart, Wednesday, December 7th. We've got a bullish earnings alert, meaning that analysts are raising their estimates and there's a pattern of positive earnings surprises. So the stock kept going and made new highs. Relative strength was strong, but on this last new high, based on the Trump rally, we have another pattern of negative money flow at a new high, time to exit the party, sit on the sidelines, look for a buying opportunity if money flow improves and the stock gets oversold ahead of that December 7th earnings report. Now, consumer discretionary was weak and consumer staples are weak. Now, consumer staples are those mundane companies like Coca-Cola and Kellogg, General Mills, Colgate, but they tend to have high yields and low growth prospects. And they were the ideal candidates for people searching desperately for yield in a zero interest rate environment all through 2016. So they were bid up to very, very strong and unrealistic valuations. And that being 35% of the power gauge model turned the power gauge bearish. We had relative strength sell signals on the XLP starting in July, and it's been underperforming the market with negative money flow ever since. So it's a sector you wanted to avoid and still avoid. Here are two examples. Estee Lauder, wonderful name in perfumes and cosmetics. Made billionaires out of the two brothers who took it over from their mother, Ronald and Leonard Lauder. One of them endowed a new museum in New York City. Great products. Company has been underperforming. Sell signals up here. The power gauge has been bearish since May. Money flows weak. Stock made a new 52 week low. These are the stocks you want to avoid. You start with the sector. Then you go to the industry group, which is soaps and cosmetics. So we could have been looking at Cody, 
Unilever, Colgate would have seen the same pattern, or Monster Beverage. Now, this stock had a good run. We had a power gauge bullish, and then it turned bearish in mid-August. We had a number of sell signals, negative earnings surprises, stock making sharp new lows from 50 all the way down to $40. These are the stocks you can be out of if you do this top-down sector and group analysis. Now let's look at what's likely to benefit from a Trump presidency, the financials. Now financials, this is the XLF. They took the real estate stocks out of it. So this is a pure financial banking, insurance company, brokerage index now. It's not sullied by the REITs. And prior to the election, this ETF, the large cap financial ETF, was outperforming the market. Here's the relative strength indicator with the bullish personality change. Now, why was it outperforming the market? Because everybody was anticipating an interest rate hike in mid-December. Gradually rising interest rates are great for financial stocks. It means they can lend at a higher rate. They're borrowing very cheaply from the Fed. There's a metric called the net interest margin, and people were placing their bets on the financial sector ahead of the election. And then Donald Trump wins in a surprise victory. And guess what? Donald Trump wants to roll back some of the Dodd-Frank regulations, which have been significantly impacting the financial stocks in a negative way. There's going to be less regulation in a Trump administration. That's good for the financial stocks, good for the banks, the insurance companies, the brokerage firms. And you saw the financial stocks spike up to big, big new highs. Now, in our weekly market insights, over the past month, we've recommended five stocks, one every week. Three of them have been financial stocks. One of them has been PVH, which you saw, which made a new high. But starting in October, we saw this doing this group and sector top-down analysis six weeks ago. Morgan Stanley, we said to buy it on a dip in anticipation of new highs. It's made new highs. Goldman Sachs, pullbacks to 170. Principal Financial Group, we said to buy it on a sideways move below 54. You can do this yourself by applying these very disciplined methodologies. So let's look at a couple of the charts. Here's Principal Financial. Positive earnings surprise. This is a company that creates insurance products, annuities, and other insurance products. Spiked up to a new high. Do we want to buy the new high spike? Absolutely not. You're, then you're in the mob. You're with the crowd, and that's the worst place to be. You want to wait for that pullback? You got the pullback under 54, and then the stock spiked up to a new high. And that's what you basically want to be doing, in my view, with all the financials now. Here's Goldman Sachs. We had a buy signal here, our relative strength buy. Power gauge turned bullish. You had a positive earnings surprise. This all happened pre-election. You finally got a little bit of sideways to down action. Trump wins and you go up to 210 from 178 because regulations are going to be rolled back. And that's very good for a firm like Goldman Sachs. Do you want to buy it up here? Absolutely not. We had a 2.7% pullback today. We're likely to get some more sideways to downside action. That's when you want to step in. When the stock gets oversold, pulls back to a more reasonable level. Don't want to chase. You want to buy the dips use some methodology for monitoring these stocks. Now, it's not just the large financial names that have gone up. Here's Zions Bancorp. It's in the very strong banks and thrifts group. Power gauge rating's been bullish since March. It's been outperforming the market. You had a buy signal, a positive earnings surprise. And then after the Trump victory, you spiked up from 32 all the way to 37. And finally, at a gap down today, giving you some relief if you're looking to buy it down 3% earlier today. You've got to be disciplined. It's the right sector. It's the right group. But you've got to buy at the right time. And one last 
sector, the transportation sector, XTN. I'm sure you all heard that Warren Buffett announced that he made major commitments in four airlines. And because of that, this index spiked up yesterday and the stock spiked up with it. But the transportation stocks have been outperforming the market. Here's our relative strength indicator since early September. If you waited to find out that Warren Buffett liked Delta Airlines, you were too late to the party because yesterday, this is a chart from yesterday, the stock gapped up to a new high, new six-month high to 49. You didn't want to buy it at 49. You wanted to buy it when the power gauge turned bullish in September and you got a positive earnings surprise and you were able to buy it in the 40-41 area instead of paying 49. So now you've got to wait for it to pull back. But the Chaikin methodology can put you in ahead of the crowd. Now, I mentioned a number of times that we have a stock screener, and I'm just going to show one example of that. It's so fast, and it's so much more powerful than any other screener out there because it enables you to screen on any of the 20 factors in the Chaikin power gauge rating. So what I did here, again, on the webinar I gave on November 2nd, ahead of the election with the market in the midst of that nine-day down, uh, down streak was to try and find stocks that were making new one-month highs that were up at least 5% with positive earnings surprise and analysts raising their estimates. The reason I was doing this is under the assumption that the market would reverse itself and move back to the upside, I wanted to find the stocks that were likely to be market leaders. So using this very simple screen, which took me about 15 seconds, I narrowed our universe of 5,000 stocks down to 17 stocks. So there's Goldman Sachs. Here's Northrop Grumman in the aerospace group, which spiked up from 225 to 250. And the one I'm going to show you is Mentor Graphics. 2894 actually gave a buy signal that day, satisfied all these criteria, there's your buy signal, and look what happened. They got a takeover bid. The stock spiked up 18% from 30 to 36. Now, this illustrates two key points. The power gauge has been bullish off and on for a year. You had a bullish personality change with the stock at $20, a string of positive earnings surprises and strong money flow, and then you get lucky. And Thomas Jefferson said it as well as anybody. He said, the better prepared we are, the luckier we get. And this is a classic example of that. Using that screen in a very disciplined way to find the stocks that are likely to be the market leaders. So Chaikin Analytics, which we've been using to illustrate these key concepts of combining fundamentals with technicals and monitoring institutional buying, now includes an options idea module, a screener, earnings alerts, intraday charts, and news. And John Malden, as Ed D'Agostino said, did a really deep dive on this, had his people look at it for over a year, and he gave us this wonderful endorsement. I'm impressed by what Mark has done. My analysts are enthusiastic users of Chaikin Analytics and use it to analyze the trades and recommendations of our writing team. Mark's system has been integrated into our routine due diligence process for vetting and evaluating potential investments. It's the best endorsement we could ever get. And Ed D'Agostino has reinforced that. He uses it to manage his own retirement plan. So we'd like to make it as painless as possible for the Malden economics community to take advantage of the disciplines that we've built into Chaikin Analytics. As a webinar special, we've reduced the price for an annual subscription to Chaikin Analytics, which is normally $1,950, to only $1,650. Go to chaikinanalytics.com slash Malden. And Joe Bacella is going to put up a link into your chat box and click on it so you can see in a minute when he takes control what our shopping cart looks like, but that $300 discount will be pre-populated. This offer expires Sunday night, November 18th. 
Now, along with Jaken Analytics and everything we've showed you, you get group tutorials. We did a webinar with Jaken Analytics in Malden back in August, got a ton of new subscribers, and they all had the benefit of Joe Bacella and his customer success team doing these group tutorials to help them know what to do with the product, how to use it, and take advantage of these features. You also get my colleague John Schlitz's morning insights, so you don't have to stay glued to CNBC to find out what's going on pre-market, the futures, the foreign markets overseas, and you get my weekly market insights, and you just saw an example of five straight weeks of buy recommendations, one a week. They're not meant to be buy and sell system. They're meant to show you the way I think and use the system so that you can do it for yourself and become independent. Now, one final testimonial. I haven't done many because I think John Malden and Ed speak for this better than anybody. But one of our subscribers said, 10x return in five days. In the five business days that I've been using Chaken Analytics, I've paid for the subscription over tenfold. These initial results are nothing short of astounding. Please extend my thanks to the entire Chaken team. And as Ed will tell you, this really is a team effort. I started this with my wife, Sandy, seven years ago. We're now 26 people in Philadelphia dedicated to your success, walking with you every step of the way because your success is our success. So I'd like to offer you one final inducement, a fast action bonus exclusively for the people on the webinar tonight. If you subscribe by midnight tonight, you'll get access to an exclusive live event next week on Tuesday from 1 to 1.30, where I'll, I'll analyze in a live session the first two weeks of the Trump market and which sectors and industry groups to own or avoid in 2017. We'll go more deeply into how to use Chaken Analytics to find these groups and sectors and the stocks within those sectors. So if you sign up tonight, by clicking on that link that Joe Bacella is going to put up, you'll be on one of our onboarding sessions before the week is out, before Thanksgiving, and you'll be able to attend this live session special for the Malden Economics community, but you have to subscribe by midnight tonight. So with that, I'm going to ask Joe to put up the link and click on it to show our checkout page and turn the webinar back to Ed D'Agostino with a big vote of thanks for giving us this opportunity to share with the Malden economics community a methodology that I'm very passionate about. I came out of retirement to do this, and I'm absolutely thrilled that people like John Malden and Ed D'Agostino have embraced the Chaken methodology and the Chaken power gauge rating. So Ed, why don't I turn the microphone back to you for any final words? Well, all I can say to that, Mark, is that was a great presentation. Thank you. I've been to your office in Philadelphia. I've, I've met your team. We've all done a lot of due diligence on you and your system, and that's why we're comfortable introducing you to our, our valued readers. Uh, and I suspect that everyone on this call now knows why. Your system has become a linchpin for our research. It's, it's easy to use, it's powerful, it saves us a lot of time, and it works, as you just demonstrated. So I, I would say that I, I've attended three of your tutorials. Uh, they're incredibly informative, they're easy to apply. I use your screening tool all the time. Uh, all I can say is if, if you're an active investor or a professional, Shaken Analytics is a system you really should consider adding to your research process. So I hope you found the presentation helpful. And uh, for everyone on the call, thank you for your time. I, we do appreciate it. Ed, thank you. And now I'll turn it back to Joe Bacella to wrap it up. All right, everyone. Well, we want to thank you all so much for coming out this afternoon. We want to, of course, thank Mark Chaikin, as well as Ed D'Agostino for joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded, so keep an eye out for this in your inbox tomorrow morning. But in the meantime, uh, Mark's offer 
uh, chickenanalytics.com forward slash Malden. As you can see on the page right now, simply clicking on the link that is available in your chat window, uh, you'll be able to simply access this page. Uh, as you can see on my screen right now, very simple, very straightforward, and very important. Uh, today is Wednesday of this week, which means that we have two more of those tutorial webinars that Ed was just referencing. Uh, these are called our onboard sessions, which are available for all of our subscribers. And this is to make sure that anybody using our Chaken Analytics program is able to hit the ground running. And that's really what we value here with our users. We want you to be able to make those returns as you've seen in the testimonials today as quickly as possible um, and get right up to speed. Um, so again, that'll be available for all subscribers who register tonight, two o'clock Eastern time tomorrow afternoon. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, no better way to take advantage of that by also uh, using Mark's offer here today. So uh, on behalf of everyone here at Chicken Analytics, we want to thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to having you on the onboard session tomorrow afternoon. So thank you again and see you next time.